Good morning. It's Bernard Nomberg with another weekly episode of Nomberg Law Live, and I've got my teammate and longtime friend from Tulsa, Dr. Derek Gregg, on the other side. How are you doing this morning, Doc? Hey, I'm great, Bernard. You know, I used to be able to call you Bernie. Can I still call you Bernie? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. As long as you catch those passes, you can call me anything you want. <laughs> Well, for those of you who don't know Derek, Derek and I were teammates at Vanderbilt. Derek is originally from Huntsville, and he came in with a highly recruited class two years behind me. We got to play on the same team uh, my junior and senior years, 88 and 89. And Derek has just gone on to do some wonderful things, and I'm so glad he's got a few minutes before he, he heads off to a basketball game in Texas. Derek, how's your day going this morning? Oh, it's, it's going great. You know, it starts early in college athletics. Great thing about a job like this is really you don't know what you're going to do from day to day. And you remember Brad Bates, who was our strength coach, who went on to become sure. an athletic director. When I became an AD, he told me, he said, try not to go into a day with your schedule full of things because it's always going to change. You're going to do something different. And uh, that's basically the way that it's been already. So looking forward to going with these guys down to Houston and playing a little basketball tomorrow. Well, we uh, I certainly wish you guys the best of luck. I know y'all are fighting for the conference lead right now, but uh, and it's a crucial time setting up the conference uh, standings and the uh, the tournament coming up, and then the big tournament after that. But uh, we got so many things to unpack here, Derek, and I really appreciate seeing you and spending a few minutes with me this morning. Absolutely, uh, Derek. I I knew of you before you knew of me. I knew of you coming in with that highly touted recruiting class. Uh, in 88, and I just, I don't know if I've ever shared this with you, but for so many reasons, just you out on the, the football field reminded me of some of those great players I idolized uh, back in the 70s and 80s, most notably also played at Alabama A&M, John Stallworth. You just had that grace and that those ability, those intangibles that just reminded me of that Hall of Fame player. Uh, I don't know if he was an influence for you or an idol for you, but he he really set the bar high. And that's really why I ended up being a Steelers fan back in the day when I was a little kid. Oh, yeah, I like to talk about John Starworth. He was a big influence on me. And actually, he's my all-time favorite receiver. My second one is Steve Largent, who's actually a Tulsa graduate. A lot of people don't that's know right. that. That's right. I actually got to uh, be around John coming up because my best friend coming up in elementary school all the way through high school his name's melvin hines his dad and john actually started a construction company together and so john always did very well with his money off the field you know those guys didn't make as much money back then but he started that construction company and then he bought an aerospace company and he's doing very well for himself i appreciate you saying that i play like him because um he he was always the epitome of grace i think he should have gotten into the hall of fame a lot earlier than he did but i'm glad that lynn swan was able to get him in and so i stay in contact with john oh that's so awesome and what was awesome for me uh being mainly on the scout team by this point at, at vanderbilt i didn't get to throw the passes to you very often because you were over on the other field with the first teamers uh working out and i was always jealous that they got to throw to you and i I had to throw to some of the second and third team guys, but we, we can skip some of those Vandy days for now. But I want to tell a, a little bit about you, Derek, because I'm, I've am i always been impressed with what you've accomplished, but even more so than that, the type of person that you are. And we're going to get into to the book that you wrote a few years ago, 40 Days of Direction, Life Lessons from Talented Men. We'll get into this in a few minutes as well. But... Derek, I, I think you and I last saw each other when Michigan played, uh, excuse me, when Vanderbilt played at Michigan, it would have been your first year, uh, 2006, the fall of 06, uh, you were at Eastern Michigan. I think you had just been named AD that year. Does that ring a bell? That's right. And I had worked at Michigan prior to that. So I, that's why I was able to get down on the field. I think I saw you guys maybe at a tailgate or something like that, but I've always been entrenched into the Michigan uh, Athletic Department ever since I worked there from 1997 to 2000. And so once I found out that Vandy was coming up, I definitely wanted to make sure that I got over to the game. You know, I've always followed Vandy's program since I left it and, uh, you know, hoping the best for them. But it was good to see you guys. And that's been a while back. Um, it has been. It's been the years wow. just go by so fast. So it's good to be able to reconnect. Well, and, and, and Derek, I want to say back in when you were named AD at, at Eastern Michigan, you may have been the youngest AD in the country at the time. Is that a, is that a fact? Or is that a, a correct statement? That's a 
All right, Derek has dropped off, but I'm sure he'll come right back to us. Uh, guys, let me tell you a little bit more about Derek before he comes back. Sorry, he, I'm back. No worries. Um, Derek, it it's the internet. It happens. Uh, I know you were, at East, you were at Eastern Michigan starting in the fall of, or sometime in, uh, early in 06, before you took the job in Tulsa. So tell us a little bit about that experience, about how young you were at the time and, and at a, a D1 program. Oh, absolutely. I was the youngest athletic director in the country at the time, and but I had great tutelage. I've always had very good mentors. I worked for a guy that everybody knows. His name was Coach Frank Broyles, and he was just an idol, um, just a statuesque person, someone that I looked up to. He worked 50 years at the University of Arkansas. So when I went to University of Arkansas in 2000, he really took me under his wing. And I didn't start out as his right-hand man, but after two or three years, I worked there six years, I ended up being his right-hand person. So I got exposed to everything you could possibly think of, big time football and basketball, obviously, but fundraising, the business side of things with budgets, uh, how the university really works. I got to interface with the president and the vice presidents and the provost and everybody there at the institution. And then when Coach Broyles would go to those SEC meetings, he would take me along with him. And, and back then it was several older ADs who were former coaches who always brought someone like me. So the old baseball coach at LSU, his name was Skip. He used to bring uh, Radakovich, who's the AD now at Clemson. And then uh, the older oh, wow. AD at Auburn used to bring Jay Jacobs, who ended up being the AD there. I'd go with Coach Broyles. Damon Evans would be with Coach Dooley. And so, uh, and then Derek Horn would be with the guy at Ole Miss. So we all ended up becoming athletic directors. And Mike Hamilton used to be with Coach Dickey at Tennessee. And so well, that's kind of how I <laughs> go ahead. I don't, I don't want to age either of us, but now you're the guy probably taking young bucks to the conference meetings for the athletic directors. Have you gotten to that That's point right. now where you've got some interns, or not interns, but you're mentoring uh, younger people who are coming up in this same uh, line of work and doing sports management or sports information athletic departments? Oh, absolutely. And that's one of my biggest things is mentoring people like myself. Like I say, with me coming up, there wasn't a lot of people who reached out, who mentored us. They started some things like the Athletic Director Institute around 2001 that I was able to go to. So I really take a lot of pride. And, and when I go to these conventions and conferences, I always come away with a lot of uh, business cards from other people, younger people who really want to learn a lot about the business. And I probably talk to someone younger in the business at least once a week, maybe every other week, giving them advice, um, educational advice, next steps, all those types of things. So I really take a lot of pride in that. Well, I, I want to welcome Morris Lilienthal, LeBron Stewart, Chris Raley, Don McCullough, uh, Gina Sprinkle, a whole bunch of folks have dropped in for a few minutes with us, Derek. But I want to transition. We're going to be all over the place, but I just finished reading your book. Again, 40 Days of Direction, Life Lessons from, talent, from the Talented Ten. And I want to brag on these Talented Ten. These guys were my teammates for a few years. Derek and, and these other fellas, I'm not going to list them all for now, but there were 10 or 11 of you guys who came in in the recruiting class in 1998. And you put in here highlights of each of these men, the fellas, as y'all call yourselves. And I saw where the influence came from. And what is so impressive to me, Derek, is this is not just about you. You easily could have written a book on your accomplishments and, and do it the Derek Gregg way. But what you did, and I think this comes from how close you guys were all those years, not only teammates on the field, you were brothers in the fraternity. You guys just have a bond that's very unique for this many guys who have been in contact and been so accomplished. And I want you to take a minute, tell us about the reason why you wrote the book, and then highlight a few of the, the stories in here for us. Oh, absolutely. Well, I appreciate you acknowledging the fact that it's not all about me. I was actually encouraged by several people just, hey, write that book about yourself, write it about your own story. And basically my response was, well, I don't think I've done enough yet. Um, and I was actually embarking, it took me a long time to write it because I'm so busy. And I remember telling my wife, I, I said, I think I'm just gonna stop and call this thing like 30 days of direction because I don't have another 10 chapters in me. And then it just hit me one day. I said, you know, I think I'm gonna write one chapter about each one of the guys uh, in that I came up with and make a chapter about them and then make it more inclusive. And that's where the cover came from. So what it's really about is educating 
young people, a lot of athletes, obviously, it has an athletic slant to it because we are all athletes. But anybody that's young today who's looking for a guidebook for success, and I thought it was best to just tell that through storytelling through these guys that I'm connected with. And you mentioned, you, you didn't go through all the names, but like Dr. Carlos Thomas, who's been a professor and now owns his own restaurant and catering business. Dr. Derek Payne, who's out of Memphis, who has not just one, but two dental practices. Corey Harris, who played 12 years in the NFL. Marcus Wilson, who's an entertainer, who was, you know, we were in that singing group in college. I don't know if you remember that, but I was part oh, of this singing group. I remember. Yeah, and Marcus, Marcus was the lead guy. He's always been the entertainer guy. I always like being on the stage, but he was the one that was really, really talented and carried the group. And so uh, Clarence Civilian, who ended up being one of the youngest hospital administrator CEOs in the country. So guys like that and William Brown, Lieutenant Colonel William Brown, who's about to retire from the Army. I'm looking forward to being with him and a few of our other guys down in San Antonio next month when he retires after 20 plus years in the Army of serving this country. So. Wow. Those are the type of guys that all of us went to school with, you know, and and those are the type of guys that Vanderbilt looked for, recruited. They took a chance on us because a lot of people don't know we were kind of guinea pigs. We were the largest um, African-American class that came in at that time. So there weren't even 10 or 11 black guys on the team when we got there. So it was, I think, kind of looking back on it in retrospect, it was kind of an experiment that turned out to be really, really good. So I think we opened the doors to a lot of people behind us. Oh, absolutely. I want to welcome Mark Chambliss, Richard Rice, and Jennifer Tombrello. Thanks, guys, for, for stepping in with us for a few minutes. I'm talking to my former teammate, Dr. Derek Gregg, who is the athletics director at the University of Tulsa. And, Derek, I put a link in the uh, notes here to uh, the Amazon link for your book. So anybody who wants to check that out, they just can click on that. I want to welcome uh, Mark Block as well. Derek, you're not going to remember or this at all, but I went to more than one step show. I can assure you, my friend, I, I, I went to several of those. But I want to talk about, Derek, I know that academics has always been a very important part of your life. And when you were at Arkansas, you wrote factors that positively affect academic performance of African-American football uh, student athletes who graduate from SE or Southeastern Conference institutions. And not to get too deep into the woods, not to make this a full academic uh, discussion, what made you write that book? What, I mean, that, that dissertation, what made you go in that direction with that? Well, there's several factors. Number one, my mom is highly educated. She came from two parents who were barely third or fourth grade educated. So she ended up with three master's degrees. She really, really wanted me to go to Vanderbilt. But when I got there, what I realized quickly was that we needed a system built around a lot of us to ensure that we would have some success, some success academically. So it's kind of a carryover from that. Back when I was at Arkansas, there were a lot of, um, I think, misperceptions about SEC football players not really getting education and those types of things. So I wanted to dig deeper into it and found out some really interesting research that I think transcends from when I did it back in 2004 to now, and there's some trends both internally in athletic departments and within universities, whether it's the way that the faculty embrace the student athletes, coaches influence on, on academics, teammate and peer group influence. You mentioned the fraternity, those types of things. And then the, the other things that they come in with, you know, self-motivation, their family structure, even if it's just a one parent family, like I grew up in for a while, how interested were the parents in education and all those types of things. So I got a chance to interview, I think it was 24 student athletes. It was six of the 12, it was only 12 SEC institutions at the time, Texas a and and Missouri weren't in the conference. So um, I got to interview six subsets of people. And then another thing I did was I went and talked to people about factors that contributed to ball players being unsuccessful in school. And that was just another whole subset of research. So combined all that, that thing, it was about 265 pages, but I, I did enjoy writing. It took me about nine months to write that, and obviously I completed the goal and got the doctorate, so it was a good project. Well, that's excellent. And some of those lessons, it sounds like, have come across in, in this book. And what I really liked about the book is you put challenges to student athletes at the end of each chapter. And I wanna know, or I wanna discuss this, put that on pause for just a second, Derek. When, when us old guys were coming up in the 80s, 
it's not today's modern student athlete. We didn't have all of those same influences that they have now. We certainly didn't have social media, internet, cell phones, and so forth. But now the student athlete today, or probably most people have like a, a goldfish's um, attention span, you know, just a couple of seconds because they're always being pulled. And that's not a knock on student athletes today, but that's just the way society has kind of evolved with phones and, and everything in their face. So my question to you is, with you being in charge of a D1 uh, uh, program with hundreds of athletes at the University of Tulsa, how do you guys take some of these lessons from your book and, and instill them so that they can be successful? What are you, what are you doing uh, today in 2020? Right, we, we educate, educate, educate. And myself, I don't know how many other athletic directors actually get in front of the teams and present, but every year I talk to, in particular, the football team, the men's basketball team. I talk to the women's basketball team a lot. I've talked to our soccer teams mainly because they're a little bit more high profile than the other student athletes. So it's very important to get in front of them. I always try to interface with all the student athletes through our student athlete advisory council too, but it's very important to get in front of those, those kids. And I call them kids because, and, and I'll use my, my own son as an example. He played football here at Tulsa the last four years. And I saw some of the things that he had to navigate. I call them distractions. So when I talk to student athletes, you already mentioned them. We didn't have cell phones. And I tell kids today, I said, I remember when cell phones became popular. I remember when the internet first started. And they say, my goodness, they can't imagine a life without the internet. Um, but but Twitter, they, they don't do Facebook anymore. You know, they move, that's old guys like us do Facebook. You know, it's Twitter, it's, it's some of the other things that they do that Instagram and even the things that they get information on just in time. And so a lot of those distractions are what we call uh, challenges in college uh, student athletes have to face today that we just didn't have to do. And it's very real. You have to keep up on it. Some athletic departments monitor what's going on with social media. You have team rules. Sometimes they say stay off of uh, social media around game time. All those things that we just didn't have to worry about. So it is very real. And as we get into the name, image, and likeness situation, it's going to become even more prevalent because everybody now is his or her own brand, and everybody wants to monetize that. That's, that's exactly right. And I bet for the uneducated or the uninformed athletes coming up through junior high school and high school and being recruited by schools like Tulsa, Vanderbilt, et cetera, a lot of those athletes may have these grand visions of how their brand, because they, they, they see all of this on social media, uh, whether they're athletes or musicians or actors, actresses, just people who are, and I hate this term, influencers on social media, these athletes that are coming up may have a misperception that now that there is the fair play for fair fair pay act that's coming and lots of debate how this is going to unfold, a lot of these student athletes may think, well, I have a big following on Instagram or Snap or whatever social media platform they're on. That's going to turn out, that's going to be cash immediately. How do you guys educate your student athletes about this ever evolving uh, situation? Right. Well, it's, it's brand new. And what we started to do is try to get them to understand the realism behind it, just like the realism of getting a chance to go to the NFL or the NBA. I think the statistics will bear out in time that 90 plus percent of these student athletes won't be able to really make that much money off their names, images, and likenesses. And then you have to have companies like an Adidas, so like we're an Adidas school or a Nike that really wants to brand itself with a 17 or 18 year old kid who hasn't matured, isn't making a lot of great decisions at times, those types of things. So I think when the businesses really start getting down to it, your Zion, like Zion at Duke, that's an anomaly. When I was at Michigan, the Fab Five, that's an anomaly. I could understand full well why uh, all those guys, Chris Weber, Jawan, and Jalen wanted to make money off those jerseys that were selling. But that's been that's 20 plus years ago. And so it takes a while for those types of student athletes to come along. We have one former student athlete here. His name is Bishop Louie. If you haven't heard of him, when you get off, everybody look up Bishop Louie. 
He has a million uh, YouTube subscribers, and he's an anomaly. And he's just someone who grew up here in Tulsa. He played ball with us. He was a, he was a good little football player, but he had to make a decision at the time. Did he want to do what he's doing on YouTube, which he makes a lot of money doing that, or uh, just stay a student athlete? So now at least the student athletes, those once-in-a-lifetime student athletes like that who can make those kinds of dollars, they'll be able to do both. My hesitation is that I think everybody's going to be distracted by it, mm -hmm. and I don't want to be so distracted that they forget the main reason that they're here, and that's to educate themselves. Now, I'm not against it. I'm all for in today's society, being able to get whatever you can get monetarily, legally. Uh, but also, you need to remember why you came to college in the first place. That's to educate yourself and put yourself in a better situation. You know, you're, you're so right in that the percentage of student athletes that go from the collegiate level of competition into the professional ranks is so minuscule. But that, that carrot is always out there for probably most of the student athletes, if they want to be realistic, though, they're there to get their education and enjoy competition on the collegiate the D1. Some say that's the best, uh, the most competitive. I don't know about if it always is or not, but you're right. If there's some, some education by the athletics department of their student athletes, hopefully that'll ease it a little bit more. But Derek, I, I want to give you a, a couple of folks got some shout outs here. Reese Oliver, Bubba Johnson are watching with us. Thelma Perry Brown, your cousin is watching, says hello, Ray is watching. So we got folks from all over the country who've tuned in with us for a few minutes and I appreciate that. Derek, I want to transition a little bit. I want to take you back to 88, 89, 90, 91. You and I played both played for Coach Watson Brown and then I graduated, but then the next coach was Donardo. And yes. I know that was a, a big contrast. And you had transition. You went from being a starter to, to backing up Clarence Civilian for a little while. But I'll, here, here's where I want to take you back to. I want you to tell me what was in your head. What were you thinking the very first time you lined up as a starter and you're split out wide and you're in a stadium of 60, 80, 100,000 people? What's going through your mind on that? Do you remember that time period, breaking huddle for the first time? Oh, I, I can tell you absolutely what you think. The adrenaline number one is really pumping. And I remember the one thing I, I will never forget was the first pass I caught. Um, I don't know if you were with us. We went up and we played Rutgers in Giant Stadium. So it was a big deal because we played at the Meadowlands. Yeah. And when we pulled up to practice the day before, I remember – I think we saw Lawrence Taylor and Carson and all those guys coming out. I don't know if they were practicing there. So that was already exciting enough. But to get out there and, then, you know, Eric Jones was our quarterback. So Eric was the only true Heisman Trophy candidate that we ever had a quarterback. And then the great split in on the other end was Boo Mitchell. So he caught all the passes. So when I ran down that field and looked up and saw that ball coming towards me, I, first of all, I couldn't believe Eric threw it to me. And so I caught it in the middle of the field. And I panicked and I, I just took off. And I remember I ended up, it was a 33 yard uh, game, but that's only because I was running scared for my life. And I ended up on our sideline getting tackled. I ran from midfield all the way across the field. I didn't know where I was going. So I'm telling you, you have to get used to it. So guys who just do that routinely, they're yeah. impressive to me because it's, it's not as easy as it looks. You know, we've been, we play ball forever that was the big goal to get on an sec team but once you're out there and you're in the mix and you're running down the field and uh you're playing alabama and auburn and georgia and all these guys and in those full stadiums it, it's real so i i really commend any student athlete who does that you, it's a lot of time it's a lot of sacrifice people always say that you know we got our education for free you know that that's not true we were up at six o'clock in the morning pushing cars running doing all those things to earn our education. So I like to change that vernacular and uh, give a shout out to all the student athletes who are out there doing that every day. Absolutely, because back then there weren't the time limitations that the NCAA later imposed. And it was 40, 50, 60 hours a week, whether we're in the parking deck on campus pushing cars on Valentine's Day up that ramp in the snow outside. Yeah, I know you remember that. Or Coach Bates had some awesome, you know, remember he had something called SMA, sick mental attitude. And that was just his way of creating a mindset to get you to perform better. But going back to what you talked about, Derek, about being on the field, 
I think that the, the athletes who perform the best, in my opinion, are the ones who can slow their heart rate down and can slow the game down. And I've heard many, like Russell Wilson, I've heard many be Mike Trout from baseball, talk about the mental aspects of performing. And I know it's, it doesn't have to just be on a sports field. It can be in the, the boardroom, the classroom, wherever you may be. You just become more comfortable with the more repetitions that you do. And as long as you've been doing this work as an athletics director for many years, Eastern Michigan and now at, at Tulsa, what gets you nervous? What gets your heart pumping when you're doing your job? Yeah, I'll tell you exactly what makes me nervous. Something that I had to do yesterday and I've gotten a lot better at it, is go before our trustees and people who aren't that versed in college administration, higher education. The board of trustees controls and governs the institution. You always have the president and then your peer. I'm a vice president here, so we have peer vice presidents. I answer to the president. We have the provost who's the chief academic officer. But when you go in front of the board, and I had to go in and ask for about half a million dollars to do something that we're trying to get done with ESPN, television production yesterday. And so you always have to be on the money on everything. You get asked questions from people that you didn't even knew, know had an interest in athletics and those who may not, they're business people. And so, but I, this is my 14th year of being an athletic director, which is a long time, more than half my career. So now when I get in those situations, it's the same thing you say, it, the room, I carry the room, things slow down for me. I told my wife probably about two years ago, I said, I think I finally come into my own as an athletic director where I'm not intimidated. I'm not as nervous about these things. These people are people like us. They care about the institution. They just want answers. And then um, the main thing was I walked out of there with the, what I needed to get done. And uh, we'll have another one in March. So I'll start getting ready for that one in a couple of weeks. It's it's like another performance, but you're right. My buddy Parker Larison and, and Ponchatoula, Louisiana said, great insight on mental aspects of performance. And it's no different, in my opinion, you lining up at, at split end or receiver during an SEC football game. You took, it, 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 those are some of the lessons that I took being under center in, a, in, a, in any ball game. And they've translated easily to me in your academic career, in your professional career. Uh, Derek, I got a question from Richard Rice, one of my buddies here in Birmingham. Uh, I know you're very happy at Tulsa, but here's the question. Does Dr. Gregg have any interest in leading an athletics department in the SEC? <laughs> well, I have a lot of experience in the SEC. I'll start with that. Um, the thing about an SEC institution is the resources. The resources and institutions like that are so vast compared to some of the the two athletic director jobs I've had have been very good jobs. We don't have those types of resources. I've worked at Arkansas, I worked at Vanderbilt, then I worked at Michigan. So I know the, the two contrasting things. And the one thing you want to be able to do as an athletic director is provide your coaches and your student athletes with, with as much as you can possibly. Not all of the, you know, people hone in on the charter flights or they're doing this or they're serving them that. But those things are necessary when you're going up against institutions who student athletes and coaches are accustomed to getting those types of things. So I think the great thing about an SEC institution or a Big Ten institution is they're getting 40 or $50 million from the conference based on the television deals that they have, which is phenomenal. So the question just then becomes, where do you put that? Are you giving your student athletes and coaches um, the greatest advantage to go out there and compete? So. I think I'm just like any other athletic director. I want to be able to provide whatever I can to the student athletes wherever I wherever I am. Been great here at Tulsa. I'm looking forward to continuing here. And uh, as for the future, we just say one day at a time. We'll see. That's right. That's right. And I'm going to ask you about Tulsa in just a second. I want to welcome um, ch uh, childhood friend Carol Lee Wright, another childhood friend David Hudson, John Messer. We've got a whole bunch of folks who's checking in here with you, Derek. Uh, Parker says, please take it easy on LSU <laughs> if you do come back to the SEC. I don't know about that. We'll talk about that another day, Parker. Uh, Derek, I want to talk about Tulsa. I want you to tell us what, what good things are going on on your campus, not just athletically, but anything that you see you want to talk about. I want to know what's going on at the University of Tulsa these days. 
Absolutely. A lot of people don't know Tulsa is a hidden gem. It's a great city. It's about a million people here in the city. And the university, I actually became acquainted with it when I was the deputy athletic director over at the University of Arkansas, because we're only about 120 miles away from Fayetteville. So we would come over here for competitions. My wife would actually, before Fayetteville got to be more of an expansive city like it is now because of Walmart and that influence, uh, she would come over into this city to shop. If we have to go to a formal, she'd come over here and look for a dress. When we came back from my press conference, she reminded me of a couple of restaurants we'd been to uh, formerly. So it's a great city. Our institution is a private school. A lot of people don't know that. It's the smallest FBS Division I-A school in the country, but we're operating in the American Athletic Conference, which is the most elite conference that we've been involved with. So when I came here, my charge was to entrance us or get us into the conference, which was partly already done, but to make sure that we could perform uh, on the fields and courts of play. So the transition, creating the strategic plan, which um, has gone very well. And, and right now in the athletic department, we've won 18 conference championships in the last few years. And we've been in the conference one year less than everybody else that started it. So that's tied, I think, first with Houston. We've come in second 18 times. We had a Rhodes Scholar here. Last semester, we had over 50 student athletes with a 4.0 GPA, uh, 4 GPA, which I never got when I was playing ball in college. Uh, we had over 250 kids who had a 3.0. And so we're just doing well athletically. We're trying to raise money right now. We're working on our weight room, which was built 20 years ago in the basketball arena. Uh, we added a, a new weight room for just the basketball teams and the volleyball team. But now we're working on the larger weight room which will be about another three, $4 million project. We're about halfway into raising money for that. So wow. um, a lot of things going on here at Tulsa, a lot of great things. And right now we're right up there at the top. We mentioned it at the beginning in basketball. So I'm going with the basketball team down to the University of Houston. We play tomorrow night, I think ESPNU, uh, but we play most of our, because of our television contract, we play most of our, or all of our uh, competitions on an ESPN platform. ESPN, ESPN2, ESPNU, sometimes ESPN3 that will be replaced by ESPN+. Plus. So that's the business part of what goes on. You always have to have in mind those types of things. And that's what I talked to the board about yesterday, about monies that we need to start our pre-production for the games that we're going to have to produce next year with the new football contract and, and TV media rights contract. Well, Derek, and those are all just such impressive things. And for those of you who don't know, some of the other schools and institutions that are part of this same conference that Tulsa's in, you've got Houston, you've got SMU, Memphis, UConn, Temple, UCF, USF, East Carolina, Tulane, I don't know if I'm Cincinnati. I mean, those are some yep. powerhouse schools, not just athletically, but some great schools in there academically. And you guys are right there in the mix for all of the sports. So I applaud what you've done thus far. And I know that you've got a lot of good things on the, the horizon. I want to pivot just a little bit, Derek, and we're getting close to the end of our, our conversation. And boy, it's been great catching up with you, and I sure appreciate your, your time. Uh, also, I want to uh, welcome Loretta Boggs Shapiro and Leanne Montana Todd. Thank you guys for spending a few minutes with my former teammate, Dr. Derek Gregg. He's up in, at the University of Tulsa as the athletic director. Derek, you keep a card in your wallet that has three numbers on it. 1.06. I want you to tell us the significance of 1.06 and why it's remained with you all these years. Well, that's that's a part of who I am. And, and one of the chapters, and I talk about this when I talk to student athletes and when I get invited to corporate breakfasts or I'm emceeing or whatever, is remember to always remember where you came from and who you really are. And so that 1.06 was actually the GPA I had my first semester at Vanderbilt as a student athlete. Now that's coming off of being a, a top 20 player in Alabama who was highly recruited. I was in the honor society in school. I was Mr. Lee High School. I had done everything I could on the high school level and then basically ran into a bus saw that you know a lot about college athletics. I tell kids all the time, Forget high school athletics. Once you get on that stage in college athletics, it's a totally different uh, atmosphere, a totally different ball game, pun intended. And so the 1.06, it keeps me grounded because, yes, I've gone on to do a lot of things I tell people all the time, but I have to remind student athletes that I didn't start here. The, the, when you see me at these functions and I'm on the stage and all that, that's a byproduct 
of the 1.06. So I keep that to remind myself that, hey, my friend, this is where you started. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget. I always say I'm just a poor boy, poor country boy from Alabama who did what my mom told me to do, went to Vanderbilt and um, have done a lot of good things since then. But it's not about me. I'm standing on the shoulders of a lot of people, including Coach Jerry DiNardo, who you mentioned, my mom, my grandfather, a lot of those people and a lot of our teammates. So it's been a great ride so far. Well, for those of you who don't know, you may have started with a 1.06, but by your senior year, you were all all academic, all SEC, if I remember correctly. I was, and you know, I was I was uh, laughing at that because some of the guys were like, what? They were reading, they were looking at the list. They were like, your name's on the list. I said, hey, I told you I'm smart, man. I've been studying, but uh, it took a lot we'll to get you up there. Well, you know, yeah, it, it, it took from that freshman wide-eyed, you went from being a, a big fish in a small pond to a small fish in a huge pond, and as academically oriented as our school is, Vanderbilt's no joke. You got to make those grades, but you figured it out. And and I'm going to bring us to a conclusion of our, our discussion today, Derek. I want to just tell you, frankly, I think this book should be required reading for anybody who is transitioning from high school into college. It is a roadmap, guys. If you haven't read this, you need to get your hands on this because Derek and his buddies, the fellas, all 10 of these guys have all made something of themselves and not just by getting by. They have all excelled in their respective fields. But what I also like, what is so great about this, Derek, is you guys have remained friends all these years. You probably don't see each other very often because of all your travels and everybody being so busy, but I guarantee it just takes one text or one phone call and you pick right back up where you were the last time you guys were together. Is that fair? Yeah, no question about it. It's funny you mention that because I texted, Corey Harris texted me this morning, um, Jason Brown's wife, they had a surprise 50 year birthday party for her. So Derek Payne went up there for, for that and he represented us. And we probably on group text, the, the eight or nine of us, we text each other at least once a week. So yeah, the, the bond is strong. We've, we've, we're as close now as we were then. We've all gone through a lot of different things. We're mature. We have children. And so it's been good to to revel in that. Anthony Carter's daughter is a, a track star down there in Nashville, and she's going to Lipscomb to run track. And he sent us pictures of him and, uh, his, and, and his former wife, Renee. I don't remember Renee's last name. I think it was Renee Carter, played basketball at Vanderbilt. So their child is going to play, uh, going to run track at Lipscomb. So all those memories and all those things, uh, but we all started right there at Vanderbilt, so it, it's it's a big part of our lives. Dr. Derek Gregg, I can't thank you enough, my friend. This has been a lot of fun for me. I hope you've you've been okay going down memory lane a little bit today with us. Oh, absolutely. And remember, next week I'll be in Birmingham for the American Athletic Conference Indoor Track Championship. So I'll let's try to hook up and have breakfast or something. Oh, I, I look forward to it, guys. That's going to conclude today's Nomberg Law Live. As I try to each week, bringing you interesting conversations with people in their areas of expertise. And Derek really fits that bill in several areas and such a great conversation. So guys, I'm gonna sign off for now and we'll catch you next Tuesday, Nomberg Law Live, 10 a.m. Central, 8 a.m. Pacific. Hope you guys have a great week. Take care.